Hi, everyone. My name is Barbara Vereen. I am a staff director of Local 34 Unite here in New Haven. I've been involved in the labor movement for over 36 years. I hold dual memberships to Unite here and to SCIU 1199, um, District 1199 in Connecticut. Um, I am also the war co-chair in my ward in the city of New Haven. Um, the ward co um, New Haven consists of 30 wards, 60 co-chairs and 30 older persons. Um, and so I am here to talk to you about um, what we do, um, how we organize and why having allies actually matter um, in what we have done over the, I, the, the last 30 years here in New, ha in New Haven, but mainly I wanna say the last 15 years in engaging and having a strong relationship and allies with our community in New Haven. Okay. Um, so I am gonna start, I'm gonna start by showing Okay, I gotta, I gotta, I'm, give me one second. I just gotta share my screen. Nope. Stop sharing. Okay, I did, give me one second. I'm sorry. Oh, I gotta make this smaller. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So I gotta move all this stuff out my way. Okay, I apologize. So how do we build a strong union and community relationship to face our challenges together? So if you don't know, <laughs> Yale is the number one employer, Yale New Haven Hospital and Yale University is the number one um, employer in our city. Um, Yale University has a $32 billion, billion would it be, dollar endowment and that is climbing. Um, and the hospital is not far behind them. And they have, and they like to tell us that they're two separate employers. Um, they're, they're not jointly connected, but it says different in our community. And you would think, um, they're the number one in the region, and you would think that more people will be, that live in the city of New Haven. And we have a code word for our black and brown neighborhoods, um, the neighborhood of need. Uh, will be employed there, um, but that is not the case in this city. And so one of the things we set out to do was to figure um, to build a better relationship with the community as we um, were, okay, I think I'm getting ahead of myself. So let me go here. So in our union, we, um, Keeping our union standard was getting harder and harder over the years. Um, you know, keeping affordable health care, secure employment, and a good living wage. And people wanted to retire with dignity. We are one of the few places that have a defined pension plan. As many people know, companies are now going to 403Bs and 401Ks. They're making it look really good. Um, but uh, you know, we have a defined pension plan, which means that when we retire, that we do not, um, y'all will pay us for the rest of our lives. And so we want that and we want to share it with other people as well. And at the same time, our city was in a crisis, right? Um, crime is at an all time high in the city. There's a job crisis. People can't find um, good jobs. Um, there's there's jobs there, but it's jobs that people have to work two and three jobs in order to um, 
to provide for their families, right? There's a lack of youth opportunities once kids hit 13 and um, there's nothing for them to do unless they are in the judicial system. And we need to find ways that we are rectifying that. Um, downtown is booming, right? Any place that Yale touches is booming, but the neighborhoods around it, i.e. neighborhoods of need, the black and brown neighborhood over the last 20 years were, um, is dying, right? Um, crime is up, the neighborhoods are, um, the neighborhoods are not doing well and thriving like downtown in the Yale areas are. And the lack of affordable housing, um, they're pushing, um, they're pushing us out. Um, their, the rents are going through the roof with the gentrification of our neighborhoods so that Yale is growing, having a, um, a bigger footprint in New Haven. Um, and they, um, they have 54% of the land and they're tax exempt. So 46% um, of the people, um, the residents of New Haven is footing the bill because so much of our land is non-taxable. We realized that we needed to do something different. We couldn't keep doing the same thing that we did for the first um, um, 20 years of our union, fight, go on strike, fight, go on strike. We actually needed to do something different to um, that build more strength. Um, and not only for us, but for the people around us, right? And so at that point, um, a bunch of our members were starting to get more mobilized. And once they got immobilized in the union, they started mobilizing in their communities and they wanted to see something different, right? And a bunch of people, uh, I can say a bunch, about, about 15 to 16 people came to us and said, you know what? We want to run for Alder. We need a change in the city. We need to do something different. We need to take back the city that was really being ran by Yell's puppets. Um, we need to take back our city and put it back in the hands of the people so that the people can get something and get something from the city and make our city better. Uh, and so we ran 18 races of of people who wanted to run, right? It was community folks. Some people even worked for the union um, and worked for the university and it was like, we wanna run. And so we um, we told Yale, it was in 2011, we told Yale that um, we have some people who wanna run for election. So we needed to delay our negotiations. And they was like, oh, you guys wanna play politics? And we were like, well, what we're doing now isn't working for us and it isn't working for the city. And so we ran those 18 races. And I like to ask this question to people. Um, how many of those races do you think we won? That I, I might've gave the answer. I can't see, I don't know if you can see. D, anybody got their hands up to take a guess? Not yet. So who wants to guess? Okay, so, all right, let's see one person. Karamu, you're, now click your mic to open it, Karamu. Karamu, you have to put your cursor over the mic to open your mic. All right, so no. So go on, go on, uh, Barbara. Okay, so we won 17 of the 18 races. And then we went back to the negotiating table. Um, and I can tell you, the, 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 the power dynamic shifted almost immediately. We settled a contract three months later, in which normally it takes us about 18 months to settle a contract. When we won those 17 races, it changed a bunch of things for not only the union, but also the community. Together with our allies, we were able to strengthen our union and strengthen our community, right? Um, in our union, we trained um, 150 new committee, right? 
we added a hundred new stewards, which is different people. They wasn't the same people. Um, so we increased our structure by 250 people. We also brought 25 of our members out on a leave of absence from their job to help build our union stronger, but also to help and assist and build in the, commu the community stronger, right? Uh, we distributed over 2,800 contract books to our members. And then in order to have our members buy in to our community program, we asked our members, would they donate anywhere from five to $10 a week, make a commitment that it would come out of their paychecks to tip to ensure progress in which that money could be used for our political campaigns, right? Um, and we had f over 525 of our members sign on to donate a, anywhere from a dollar a week. Um, somebody donated $10 a week, um, but any range from there. But the average that people donated was about $5 a week to make sure that we could continue our political program. And in our community, we had 17 new alders. We didn't stop there because New Haven is a democratic town. Um, we and it has um, 60. Um, it has 30 wards, but it has 60 co-chairs, right? And so we won 40 seats in the democratic on a democratic town committee, right? And we built committees in our neighborhoods, right? We built committees so that we can have a structure that we. Um, oh, that's my next slide. So this slide is called how we did it, right? We built structures, right? And our structure consists of like there's committee people, there's key leaders, there's LOAs or volunteer organizers, people. Um, um, we develop a training with common language. So whether you was in the community organizing or whether you were in the neighborhood organizing, it was the same thing. You were doing the same thing. You understood what a committee person was. You understood the level of what a key leader was, was and, and so on. And then we did value-based training. Value-based training in which we need to make sure like, you know, it was, we were bringing a bunch of different people from different walks of life, different, looking at things differently, from different perspectives. And we had to get to, we had to get together and talk about what our values were, what are the things that we want to see? Well, you know, we did the Venn diagram, like what are the things that we had that was alike? What are the things that we had that was different? How will we um, hammer out our differences so that we can stay united as a team and as a group? And that was 11, that was about 11 years ago, right? And to this day, we use those same values that we base our relationship in to move forward and carry on that relationship. So um, and, and I'm gonna start telling some stories as I go through um, these, um, what um, the committee, what a strong member, what a committee is and talk and talk, how do we use that in our day-to-day -day organizing? how we use it on campaigns, um, how do we get people involved and what people wanting to do what we do. Um, so we want one for us, it was, we wanted people to be positive on the union, right? And we wanted people to be positive on what they want to see in the community, right? Um, we want people to have a, a personal story. What's, why do you want to do this? What do you want to see change? What are the things that you want to see change? They needed to be respected, right? They needed to be able to attend events, right? They needed to um, be able to say no, not just say yes to us, but we wanted people that were saying no and fighting a little bit with us because we know that they're in it, right? If you just get people that say yes, 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 when the water get hot, they kind of jump shit. So you need somebody, you need to be in it with them. You need to build, like, you want to make sure that that you that you're building the relationship right um we ha we have the basis of everything we do is in relationship building and then when somebody becomes a strong committee um i remember one time i was working on a hospital campaign 
um, the Yale New Haven Hospital campaign. That was one of the hardest. Um, I always get sometimes emotional, so if I get emotional on it, because it was one of the hardest things I ever did in my life, um, working on that campaign. I worked on that campaign for two years. I worked 12 to 14 hour days, seven days a week. And if anybody know the um, Yale New Haven Hospital, we were going, we got a community benefits agreement. Um, one of the things we had did um, when we was negotiating our contract, uh, because what before what we would say, people would be like, only time the union come to the community is when y'all negotiating your contract. What's in it for us? And we was like, we're in it with the community because we know we couldn't continue doing what we was doing. So we wanted to make sure we had a real, um, a real agreement. So we um, created a community benefits agreement with the community, but also because we had people on the board, on the board of, um, on the board, on the board of alders, um, they asked the hospital when they wanted to build another building enter into a community benefits agreement that allow people to have the right to organize and that they will also hire 500 people from the areas of need to work at the hospital. Um, and so we won that agreement. And so we started to organize the hospital. And the one thing about organizing the hospital, they treated their members, their workers, employees really well they gave them a lot of tchotchkes. Um, people felt like they were a real family. They didn't pay them anything. Um, people were working there 15, 16 years and making like 11, 12, $13 an hour. This is an institution that had billions of dollars, but they was paying their workers 12, 13, $14 an hour. And those workers had to pay uh, for their health care. They, they didn't have a pension. They had a four. They had a, a, a small 401k. With it was like uh, for every dollar they put in the hospital, put in 25 cents. Um, and this was the institution that um, had billions of dollars. And so we went in to organize the hospital. Um, and so we had to build those relationships, like build committee. Um, and the hardest thing to do when you're doing this work is try to organize against somebody who treat people really well, right? Because we're used to people um, not being treated well and they're like, yeah, we need a union. But when people are content and being like, you know what, it is what it is. They don't pay us well, but uh, we want what you have over there at the university that we don't have here. Um, so we had to build relationships and I had the pleasure of organizing all the ICUs and um, the uh, the ICUs and all the casual workers in the hospital, um, which there were hundreds of casual workers. You know, people. You know, they wouldn't even give people full time work. Um, and so, I had to build, and I built this relationship with this one girl named Juanita. Um, and it, it took a lot, right? Because you know, you see them, you got to talk to them. And, and they're like, they're like they don't want to talk to you. But I kept going back over and over again. And I wasn't asking her the right question. I kept saying, don't you think that um, you deserve better? Don't you think that you deserve more money? And then she would be like, I'm happy. But then I asked her, I said, if you can change one thing in your workplace, just one thing, what would you change? And that was the gateway to everything. Because uh, then she began to be like, you know, we need more of this. We need we need more money. We need better health care. We need them to, um, even though they were saying they was treating them good on the outside and giving them chotskis, but they were working long hours just to be able to make ends meet. They, was, um, they wasn't really being as respected by managers as everybody made it seem and it was once i started building and like what what was like um what's at stake for her and talking about we do this thing called state take do and so finding out what was at stake for her so that i could go back and agitate her a little bit on it um but i would have never got there if i did not one 
um, built the relationship with her. She became one of my strongest key leaders. But before I get there, I'm going to tell you what I did to get her through to be a strong committee, right? Like she had to take ownership of her work assignment. Her assignment was to get everybody on her floor to find out what everybody on her floor was for the union, right? Um, it was um, not just to be like, okay, take this assignment and go talk to people and come back, but like to really talk to people and find out what people was. And she had to listen to what people's issues were. And she had to be consistent, right? And like in her building of the people and talking to the people that she um, talked to, right? She um, she came to, we had, bef before you take a campaign above ground, you got to have like a lot of one-on-ones. Like she had to meet with me every week, sometimes two or three times a week, me and her met and talked, right? Then we talked, then we went and we talked to my lead because I was just an organizer then. We went and talked to my lead, to um, Bill, and then she'll talk to us about what her challenges were when she was talking to people. And then we'll role play, because role play is a big part of this, we'll role play those challenges and we'll send her back in, right? We send her back in so that she can go back in and talk to people. She, she asked for help. Um, and we did not go above ground, but when we did go above ground, she owned her role and went to her manager and said, I am actually working with the union, right? And her, uh, and so we worked with her manager in a different um, spectrum, but she went back to her manager. Her manager knew that she was the union committee person that was helping us get people signed up on cars when we took that campaign public, right? And so when she, she did all those things, so we made her a key, uh, she was a key leader target. And once she became a key leader, as you can see, it's a whole bunch of things you got to do when you're a key leader, right? You you own your department. You got to have weekly one-on-ones with the people, right? Um, you do, you every week, you know what you have an organizing assignment that you have to go do. You have to make sure you're talking. Mapping, we do this thing called mapping where we identify other leaders. She, identi she helped identify other leaders on other floors in an other departments. Um, and so, as you can see, there's a whole schedule. But not only did we do this in, the in our union, we also mimic the same thing for the community, right? Um, and, and, and Unite Here, we do the same type of structural organizing, no matter where you at. I went to Detroit. I worked on the Sky Chef campaign. Um, I took this, these same skills. I bought it there. And we uh, was building that union, working on Sky Chef. And it was a place where people um, had a union and they wanted to decertify the union because they was like, we don't feel like we're strong enough. And we taught them grass up organizing. And we had people say, the, the Charday, um, she worked in Sky Chef and the um, liquor and beverage. And she said, um, I, she goes, the, un the union's not doing that. And I was like, well, you're the union, right? You're the union. When are you, like, when are you gonna own that and go back and talk to your people? And she was like, and it just snapped on her. And so she was like, I'm the union. What do I need to do to make my union stronger? And we went through, we went through the trainings and we did the same thing there. So these skills are transferable no matter where you go. Um, we also, um, and so that was one of the campaigns that we worked on. And um and I'm laughing because there was another person named Tamika on this um, campaign in which she was like, she was a leader of everybody. Like she, like people would be like, go talk to Tamika, go talk to Tamika. And when we'll go talk to like, I'm not talking to you guys. I'm not talking to you. And so Charge said to me, she said, Tamika having a cookout uh, at the park. And I was in Detroit. I don't have no family in Detroit. I was just still working. And so I was like, she was like, just come to the cookout. And so I showed up at Tamika's mother's, at their family cookout. Um, 
I have my two watermelons in my hand. And I don't know if, you, if anybody remember the movie Poetic Justice when Lucky showed up to the cookout and he said, I'm Cousin Lucky. I went to Tamika's cookout and I was Cousin Barbara, right? And we went, and I went to the cookout. Her mother was like, who was that? She said, oh my God, that's the union lady. I can't believe she came here. And I was like, you know what? Um, I, I, and I, I, so we just started talking. We started playing space. We started playing volleyball and every, every, even to this day, and that was maybe 10 years ago, even, every, to this day, every year we get together and we, and I'm in Connecticut now, we get together once a year and celebrate our meeting and making their union strong. Um, and so it is really about building relationships and the work that we do. Um, and and that's in political and even in our community when we build we had these area bill meetings right um, to educate our members about um, we had a jobs campaign with the community pushing Yale and Yale New Haven Hospital and local employers not just Yale local employers to hire from within our community right um, we need um, because we have a real job crisis. And what we did was we had these meetings. We have six neighborhoods and we call them the six neighborhoods of need. And what we will do is we will um, take the war committees. We'll take the organizations within neighborhoods. You know, we got the nonprofits, we got the community groups, we got the PTO um, or PTA, um, depending on what they call it in your area. And we will target those leaders and bring them together and be like, could you bring people to, could you bring people out? And we will meet with them and we will ask them, what are, what are the things you would like to see change in your community? And then we brought that to our orders and that became their legislative agenda. And every year we will have that legislative agenda to tackle the items that will make our community better. Right. So whether you're organizing in the union or whether you're organizing in the neighborhood, the goal is always to listen to what people are saying, um, build those relationships and training. Not And like training is not just like you sit in a classroom and they train you like this is the training you get by doing by doing. Uh, I want to open it up for questions. Okay, is this Midway, Barbara? Yeah, this is Midway. All right. So the floor is now open. If anyone has any questions, please click your raised hand icon. Please click the picture of your hand and I will scroll through and try to find who you are. Nate Went, your mic is open. Nate Went, your mic is open. I'm not sharing my oh, screen, my right? My apologies. I had uh, entered that in the questions earlier. That was my pessimistic guess. Oh. Oh, so what did you guess? Oh, like I said, I'm a pessimist. So when she asked for a guess, I said two earlier. But you heard that it was 17 out of 18, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, oh. I did. That was Thank great you. to hear. Any, any, any other questions you have? Not at the moment. Okay. Thanks, sir. Marcy, your mic is open. Click your, put your, there you are. Hello, Barbara. Um, I had the pleasure of working with you multiple times. It's Marcy. And Hi, Marcy. How are you? I just wanted to say hello. And also, you know, it's funny how you said that because, you know, I had the pleasure of working with you in Georgia. I have probably about 30 family members now from the 30 days I spent there. But, you know, one thing I like that you, made tender is the actual aggression that it takes 
to convince people of the things that they need. And I learned that strictly with working with you guys, especially just like in regular local things that we try to do here in New Haven, Connecticut. So taking what I knew to Georgia was a whole nother level and it's very important. And I just want to thank you for that opportunity and thank you for your leadership because why did you go to georgia mike marcy let the people know we had to take back the senate y'all don't understand we had to do what we had to do to take back the senate and i'm telling you <laughs> i lost 20 odd pounds because them hills and them driveways ain't no joke there's no joke but it was well worth mm -hmm. everything so we're not close off one we're doing what we need to do but the fight is not over so in the future I like using unions in even i'm like midnight ministry it's just like listen if you guys all got together you wouldn't have to be here on the street mm -hmm. so, you know the people don't understand that so i appreciate of the teachings from you guys and all the leaders from unite here and we just got to keep going thank mm -hmm. you marcy mm -hmm. Let's see if anybody else That's has right. hand up. Okay, just a second. Ibrahim, did you want to say, say something? Say, yeah, I just want to piggyback off what what, um, what Marcy said. Um, one of the things when we train people in Georgia and even when we train people on the doors, you have to talk to people about their what's at stake for them, even to get them to come out and vote. Right. And that's the and I think that was the game changer in Georgia and why we could turn why we turn that red state blue or purple um, was because we were out there and we was asking people and asking people what was at stake for them in this election and then going back to them multiple times uh, and remembering what was at stake for them and bringing that conversation back to them. And that's what turned people out to vote. Do you want to go on, uh, Barbara? And, and oh no, you can go ahead. Okay. Ibrahim, you have to uh, put your cursor over your. Oh, there you are. Hi, Barbara. Hi. Um, my name is Ibrahim. I'm in upstate New York, and um, Friday I just got kind of de facto nominated to be the president or I, I got nominated, but there's no one else. So I am the de facto president of, um, of my postal union. And um, as someone who's gonna be in a, you know, a union leadership position, um, albeit a union leadership that, you know, has a, a pretty big national structure that's doing a lot more of the contract negotiating and things like that. Um, you know, what, what do you feel like your experience has been with um, you know, with union presidents and, and what, what advice might you provide for, you know, a, a crazy newbie like me heading into this new role um, and ways that I can really support um, this kind of organizing work? I think that, um, uh, I don't know how the postal union work, but I work very closely with my president. Where like, I always tell her, oh, my president is Lori Kennedy. Lori Kennington, and I always tell her like we're joined at the hip um, because in order for me to be successful, she has to be successful. In order for her to be successful, I have to be successful. So the thing that I will say um, in any union, because even when you your contracts are negotiated um, nationally, you still have to ratify them locally and the effects of what's in those contracts, uh, in those contracts, um, is important, especially in the in this day and age when they're bust, they're trying to bust the union and they're trying to t uh, send us backwards. Uh, I think that this is important for your union to educate your people, right? The, in using the structure and using the kind of organizing that we do to get people engaged, because I think for a long time I know everybody was like. The postal unions is the strongest union there is, along with the fire department and the municipal unions, right? But we see that um, unions need to fight, right? And not and even at the national level, when you have national contracts, you still have to fight and build your union stronger so they can push on the things that you guys need locally. 
I hope that was helpful. Courtney, put Courtney Garrison, put your, there you are. Hi, um, this is just a weird question. I'm Courtney, I live in Southern Ohio. Uh, how do you plan on helping to get the younger generation involved with this? I'm gonna, I'm in my senior year of high school. I am part of my student government. I help run um, the student organization to help empower uh, girls to rise to leadership of power. But in a red state like mine, a lot of them don't believe they should be in that power situation. And as a strong woman like yourself, I feel like you are a good role model for us young girls coming to, into leadership. Mm. I um I, I don't know how to answer that question, but I'm gonna take a shot at it. Um, if not us, then who? If we're not taking control um, and teaching, and Courtney, I am so happy to hear that you're like, I'm in high school and I'm leading this, right? Because I started out in high school um, when they said that we didn't have a girls or a boys, we only had a boys basketball team and I wanted to play basketball. And they was like, no, you can't play with the boys. So I went out and organized a girls basketball team for my school and we have nobody to play with. So I went to Jackie Robinson and organized a girls basketball for, uh, for their school too. Um, but I think that we, and I think it starts young, right? Well, we have to start taking, um, we have to start taking control. I think that um, doing doing exactly the looking at what people's interest is, right? What is the things that the same thing? Everybody want to change something, even when they think that is not possible. And I think celebrating the small victories, because um, I think sometimes people want big change really fast. But sometimes we got to do all the small victories that lead us to the big victories. And I think you, and that's how you build, you build people. And that's how we build the movement that can last. We got to have a lot of small victories and then we get the big victories. So do you, do you want to go on Barbara? So, so that, and then we'll open the floor at the end for dis more discussion. No, I, I think we're good to keep going. Um, okay. Because all the other stuff is just stories, and I'll, I'll tell them through answering the questions. Okay, Arthur, your mic is open. Arthur? Arthur okay. Hey, Barbara. Hey, Barbara. Um, uh -huh. I'm a 16-year-old in high school near Chicago, and, um, you know, I want to get more active in my community, and I've actually volunteered at a uh, homelessness organization and i've been doing that for a couple months now but i was just wondering um should union members study uh revolutionary theory we should be studying yes i believe we should study that i think i started out by studying with joel and art um with the um with the communist party having meetings first i was at somebody else's house and then I was posting meetings in my own in my own home um, and learning about Mark, Marxism and um, learning about this stuff. And I think everything is tools in, um, I like to be like, we're always filling our tool chest with everything that we learn, right? Um, so that we can carry it and play it forward. So I believe that we should, I think we should be learning and pulling from every every which way we can. And I think we open, and when we do that, I think we open the movement up for more people, right? Um, we Because we can't win this alone. We can't beat capitalism on our own. We need to be opening up and forming allies with other organizations and with other people as well. Sarah, your mic is open. Sarah, Maxwell. Yes. Um, how do I do this? How, how do I, how do I activate my mic? Am I, can you hear me? 
We hear you uh, ask uh, questions. Sorry, so sorry. Okay, um, my name's Sarah. I'm a community organizer in North Carolina, which you surely know is one of the so-called right to work Southern states. And mm -hmm. I'm looking, yes, ma'am. So, and I'm looking to move into uh, labor organizing, working for labor union. Um, and my question to you is like uh, traveling through some of these uh, small town communities and rural communities, not only are the um, kind of the, um, the, the powerful people in these communities, you know, obviously anti-union, but many of the uh, workers haven't, don't really know what unions are. Where do you even start in a situation like that? I think you have to start, um, one, I would like to say, um, this is just my guess, I really don't know, but I would think I would start with, commute, with doing stuff in the community, right? Um, and educating and building that out. and because a lot of times you got to build hope into people, right? Because people don't feel like nothing can change. Um, but when we talk about, because when we talk about these um, communities where they're really anti-union, um, I think you have to go, it goes back to the basics of what do they, what are they willing to fight for? Like, what's really at stake for them? What are the things that they will want to change in their workplace? Because sometimes people just, when people hear unions, they um they think of people going on strike. They think of um, lazy workers, right? I think they don't think about, and that's this much of what we do. I don't know if you see, it's like a pinch, a pinch of what we do, but people don't understand that. Um, how do you think you got the labor laws that you have, right? That we fight for health and safety. Um, we fight for fair wages. Uh, we fight um, for working conditions, period. And I think um, when you ask somebody, what are some of the things that they will change? People will be starting to talk about their working conditions. And I think that's where you start, right? You start on working conditions. Right? Are you are you in the community? You start talking about what are the things that they need to improve in their communities. Whether it's the streets, whether it's the parks, you get people working together. Cameron Harrison, your mic is open. Put your cursor there. You are. Hi, Barbara. Um, Hi. I'm in a local union, uh, UFCW in Detroit, and I was just wondering because with the, the right wing push against voting rights, I was wondering if you had any advice for a young organizer like myself, how to link uh, the struggle for the right to vote with the union struggle, like just uh, how, how I can like talk to my fellow workers about, about the right to vote and like link it back to, to the, the fight for the union and the, the working class fight together. That, that's all my question is. Mm -hmm. One of the things we always talk about when we talk about voters' rights, um, we talk about the, NL, the NLRB and how those rules had changed um, that was against workers, right? And that we need, um, we need to be pushing, right, that one, that that workers' rights, um, and your question was, how do we push people about the voter rights and them changing or of the um, the laws around voting and suppression, suppressing the vote, right? And how that affects um, unions? Yeah. And how you can get people to um, be more actively engaged and thinking about why does that matter? Yes. Okay. Um, I think it matters on a number of levels, right? Um, especially, I don't know what the demographics of your, um, of your union is, because some people might think like, oh, these voter rights only af affect the minority community, right? And it doesn't affect us because um, in the other communities. But I think that we have to be like, this is um, a human, these are human rights violations 
um, when we start thinking about taking away people's rights, thinking about um, the effects on how they are the, the voters right. Um, and when you start suppressing, then you start taking away other rights from people um, that, that that's to come. Mm -hmm. But I think in order, in order, one of the things we did was we linked up with the poor people's campaign and we attached that to um, a living wages, right? We attached it to um, just making sure that um, around the the labor laws and the NLRB when we was talking to talking about it to our members and pushing it in our communities. I don't Rosanna, know if that answered your question. Rosanna, your mic is open. Uh, click your click your. There you are. Yes. Hi, Barbara. Um, Hi. I'm I'm in Los Angeles. I'm not a union organizer uh, as of late, but I I know that I hear a lot about uh, member engagement and how do you get more and more people to, you know, to participate. And um, I heard you say you had stories, and I wonder if you had one where maybe perhaps you found sort of the magic wand or the, or, you know, that one way that has worked for you uh, in the past that you might want to share with us? Okay, I'm going to disappoint you right now. There's no magic wand. <laughs> you got to put the work in for this one, right? Um, the the If I had to say if there was a magic wand, it goes back to the um, finding out what's at stake for someone. I know I keep saying the same thing, but for every one person it's different my issue might be healthcare, or my issue might not even be work my home life might be bad i might need to be figuring out other resources because i can't pay my bills my my kid is getting kicked out of school uh i just need help all around and so you you have to build that personal relationship and I know it's hard to be like, how do you build a personal relationship with 30, we got 3,800 members, but I think that you have to, um, and that's why the structure is important, um, because I think that we have to meet people where they're at and bring them forward, right? So then we can go back to them on the things that we can agitate them, or we can go back to them and have them stand up for the things that they that they said is important to them. Um, but I, and I do understand like in this day and age where everybody is tapped out because they work in two and three jobs um, and, um, and everything is crazy in this country right now. But those, those relationships are very important because you can't push somebody from a place of, I just need you to do this. I just need you to do this. Um, it doesn't, it, it works for a minute, but then when people get frustrated and get tired, you got to go back and say, why are you doing this? Like for me, why I am, why I've been in the uh, labor movement for so long is because I wanted the better life for me and my kids. I got three sons. I'm in, I live in New Haven. Um, drugs are rampant in our city. Murders are rampant. Black boys and black young men is getting killed every day. Um, and I want something different. I wanted something different for them. And so I, I'm like, if I want something different, I have to be that change I want to see. I have to stand up for those things that's important for me and my community and for me and my union if I want a better way of life. So having your own personal story and going to people and telling people why you're in it. Scott, your mic is open. Put your cursor. Click your mic. Click. Click the picture of the mic on you. There you are. Um, Barbara, that is such a magnificent presentation. I I just can't tell you how important I think that is. And I really think we have to figure out uh, how to get that get your presentation and your message into a much broader discussion. Um, uh, with 
much more of the labor movement and much more of the community movement. I, I think it's the key to so many things that we're that we're concerned about. Um, one question I, I have is that I would like to hear your take on what's going on kind of globally in the labor movement, because it seems to me that now uh, the labor movement is is just leading a huge coalition, not just of labor, but all you know, Black Lives Matter, uh, the women's movement, all of these things are coming together uh, into a, the kind of coalition, frankly, that we need to defeat uh, the growing trend towards fascism is the way I put it. But anyway, I'd, I'd like your take on how you see things nationally and what we can do more um, to, to turn, not, to bring everything into this national movement. That's mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, Scott, I don't know how to answer that question, but this is what I will say um, on all those fronts, because the labor movement is made up of all different kinds of people, right? First, first I'm black, right? And, and I'm a woman. Right. So I think in the things that I fight for, because I think what was happening was we had people like segmenting to me and just and, um, like trying to separate, like I do this for my union and then I do this because I'm a part of Black Lives Matter. And then I do this because I'm in my community. Right. When we're all fighting for the same thing. We're fighting for justice. Not just us. We're fighting for justice on all these fronts. And what better way than to have the labor movement be a part of that? Because guess what? They, it touches all of these different things through its members. And I think it's about time the labor movement step up and not just think about the, the, their dues paying members, but look out for what is going on in the community. We can't win alone, right? The labor movement is what, about 11%? We got 11, 12% if that high. If the labor movement is going to grow, if we're going to change things in this country, we can't do it alone. We need other organizations, right? The same way when we was fighting, we can't beat Yale with $30 million with 3,800 members and $3 million in the bank. There's no way. That's like David and Goliath. Right. So what we have to do is we have to reach out and we have to form those alliances and we got to start just taking our slingshot and popping them from all angles. All right. Sorry for that analogy. Um, but um, but I think that's how the labor movement have to do it. We have to get bigger. We have to get stronger. We got to employ other members, um, other organizations if we're going to um, beat capitalism. Or, or, or at least have some say in it. All right, Barbara, can we take one more question? Yes. Okay. Anthony, your mic is open. There you are. Yes, thank you. Barbara, great presentation. Did I hear you say you contacted Jackie Robinson like the Major League Baseball Jackie Robinson concerning your basket? Oh, no, it's a school. No, 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 it's a school. <laughs> okay, I, I'm a U.S. history instructor, and I teach Jackie Robinson. It's very, very important. So I was like, "Wow, thank you for clarifying that." Uh huh. All right, Barbara, you want to make any closing um, closing remarks? Um, let me see what if was... other, let me see if there are any other hands. Okay, there there is. Jenny, your mic is open. Put your cursor on the picture of the mic on your control panel. Click it, and it will open. Put your mouse clicker on the picture of the mic on your control panel. Click it, and your Jenny Wise, and your mouth. Your oh, uh, Jenny. Yes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't know you're talking Jeremy, about. Jeremy, I'm sorry. There you are. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask uh, if you had, um, had a couple of questions, but mainly if you have any advice on discussing uh, like union efforts in a, at will state, like right to hire, which is you know, in the South, especially among where people will kind of be afraid to talk about these things because many people uh, are just too afraid of being fired. Mm -hmm. 
So I wouldn't say talk about it. I wouldn't talk about it as a union. I would just talk about like, what are the issues in our in, in your shop, right? You got that's where you first got to start at. Like, if I was, it was me, I'd be like, hey, Jeremy, how are you? I'm like, man, you know, we've been working some long hours and they ain't been giving my overtime right. They ain't putting my uh, my checks ain't been right. Well, have you seen anything, Jeremy? Or um, Jeremy, what's going on? You might be like, I mean, I've been working. I ain't been taking my breaks. So now that I know, I'm like, now that I know next time I come to you, you've been like, oh, how have those breaks been going? Have you been getting your breaks? Oh, uh, I noticed that um, John ain't been getting his breaks either. Right? You see, it's issues. If you want to start doing, like, finding out what the issues are. So you don't just go in and be like, we need a union. Um, We need a union. We need to get a union in here because things ain't right. That's a sure way to get fired. But what you do is you start talking about the issues. And like, and like, it's just a matter of fact way. So, Barbara, then, uh, yes, go on. No, no, no. So I was, that's how I would start to talk about it. And then seeing like where people are at and seeing what the issues are. And then you could build out from there. I think that's the way the union do it. We don't just come in, um, when we are getting ready to organize, we have people that work in the shop. And the first thing we ask them, like, what are the issues? How many people have this issue? How many people have that issue? And then will, will they, then we'll ask more questions as we get more in depth. Do you think they'll talk to, will they, will they talk to somebody? We don't never have people show who they are. Um, in the beginning, we don't put too many people when we're going into a shop to organize. We don't be like, well, we got five people in the shop. Let's bring them all together. No, we ask the five people, who do you talk to? How many people in your unit? Right. And we keep those people separate because we don't want, we don't want somebody. We don't want, if we were to go in and organize, um, for, we do that for a while because we don't want, if someone if, if the boss is like, we don't know who the boss got as a plan to be like, okay, I went to a meeting and Marcy and Jeremy and um and D was in the room. No, we don't do that. We we wait and we make sure we build and we make sure people are solid. We give them tests to do. So that's the way I would do. I will always start not just by talking about the union, but talking about what are the issues. So, Barbara, you have any concluding remarks, summary and remarks? Um, what I would say to my, my concluding remarks will be um, relationships are important. Um, we have to build, we have to form a lot uh, um, alliances with people that we normally wouldn't form alliances with, or we didn't think we would. Um, that goes back to the Black Lives Matter, the Me Too movement, the um, Rainbow Coalition, the um, you name it, right? Because I think we have to fight for justice, not just us. We have to fight for justice. And I think, um, one, listening, we have to listen to people, find out what's at stake, what will it take, and what you guys need to do. State take do and building relationships and building structure are the key things that I think people I want people to take away. You always have to have a structure. What's at stake, what it takes, what people need to do. Um, that's my closing remarks, Steve. So on behalf of everyone, I'd like to thank Barbara for agreeing to do this class. Um we really appreciate it. And she she struggled to uh, to help us. And uh, there there are no words. We really appreciate it. So thank you very much. Okay. And good night. All right. Good night. Thank you.